Good evening and welcome to the Cover One Salary Cap Extravaganza, our annual special to get some of our best roster construction minds together to be able to review all the fun that we can have with this uh, Buffalo Bills roster and all the fun things that we can do to be able to make it make it go. And, and tonight I am joined by my guys Anthony Prohaska from Disguise Coverage, David Fox from The Roundup, and my man Kevin Massar from Going Deep. We are going to have a lot of fun tonight. Guys, how are we doing? Living the dream. Um, you know, I say this every year, how much I love this episode. D.B. Cooper, Fountain of Youth, <laughs> El Dorado, City of Gold. Just some of the most important myths that have ever existed in the world. And we get to tackle one tonight with a salary cap. I'm pumped. I'm excited. I'm just, I'm just really thrilled to be here. All right. Anthony the, had to the leave fountain us. of youth. Uh, I had to. <laughs> the fountain of youth is a myth. Why am I in Florida then? All right, dude. keep looking. Why have I? Why have I been searching for these past years? What is going on? I don't understand. Um, so tonight's show, we are going to have some fun. We're going to kick around uh, probably every possibility that um, the Bills have to be able to create ca create cap space, but we're also going to try to create some realism of what the you know, most likely are maybe we'll lean a little on the aggressive side, but what we think Brandon Bean's actually going to do. So we're going to start with some of the most expected moves and then work our way down and go around the table here, each proposing things that we would do and that we'd like the group to consider. And then we'll make a decision. And then our awesome producers, we've got AJ and we've got Chris uh, helping us out, putting some of these things together that we're going to be able to go through and identify a running total as we go of how much cap space we've created um, as we go forward, we're going to um, each have content on all of our shows and all the other Cover One shows on maybe what we might do with that cap space. But we might even sprinkle a little bit of that at the end of some of the things that we might predict or, or like to see us do with those different areas. So um, the first piece that we're going to start with before we get to any proposals is where we stand right now. Um, there's a lot of tools out there. Um, obviously, a lot of people use mostly Spot Track or Over the Cap. Um, I, you know, I talked to Jason over, over the cap. He does a really good job, has a lot of good detail on uh, the pieces that they share. He's got it that the bills are, you know, 16.5 million over on the cap. He's usually pretty good about updating what we know of as far as incentives that got hit from last year's contracts, the different pieces that come aboard. So we're going to use that as our starting point, assuming that right now, before we do anything, the bills are already in the hole, $16.5 million. Um, I did. I didn't interview. We got both trees. I, I think the one is. Uh, I forgot. Cap, this one's the Christmas tree. one. I forgot to take it down, and because it's mainly red, I've just decided to commit to Valentine's Day for the month, as I did with this one. So that's where we're at. I like it. I like. It. I, 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 I like where your head's at. Um. So we, we'll go through and use that as our starting point. The first thing we have to do is dig out of a sixteen point five million dollar hole. Uh, before we can do anything so we're going to start with some of the obvious names some of the ones that you've seen proposed on different channels different social media platforms uh, that everybody expects to be some of the moves we'll reach some consensus on those then we'll get a little more creative as we go Anthony I will have you lead off with our main man our franchise quarterback Joshua Patrick Allen what are you going to do with Josh Allen this year so I figure we cut him just take the <laughs> millions in um, dead cap um, I concur I second Thank you. Kevin gets it. Episode yes. over. We're done. Work here is done. We've 50, saved 51, all. 51 million. It's not it's as right. it sounds. No, it's not as bad. You can dig out of that. Like, yeah, you easy. just, if two negatives meet, they make a positive. It's just basic <laughs> exactly. mathematics. It's polarity. Yeah. There you go. Polarity. <laughs> like, like a battery, but not. Um, I mean, depending on how, I think it's really just figuring out what kind of money we save with it but extension and restructuring that base salary for this year however much we want to knock it down to i mean there's like variety of options i'm assuming we're all on the same page in this regard it just comes down to how much money we particularly want to knock it down to um his base salary would end up being based on his years of service the 1.08 um, so we can, uh, in theory, knock it all the way down to that and then convert, like again, if we're just doing simple restructuring with that piece, take mm -hmm. that base salary, knock it down to the 1.080, uh, his base salary for this year is 27.5 million. So in theory, we could knock 
that down to the 1.80, take that money, prorate it with the signing bonus, spread it out over the remaining years. And that's just with the basic restructure. That has nothing to do with adding on years or doing anything like that. Um, so there's a multitude. It's it, in a good way. We know Josh Allen's going to be here for the long haul. Knock on wood. I'm still going to knock on wood because I'm superstitious. Um, so it really comes down to just hear what we want to settle on because there are genuinely a multitude of options based on the direction that we go. Um, from a realistic standpoint, this isn't just pie in the sky. Like we realistically can make a bunch of money. So, you know, obviously the ones we talk about tonight, the easiest ones are where the money's already guaranteed and you're just choosing how you slice and dice it, where you go. There's no negotiation with the player. There's no dead cap incurred. There's honestly not a lot of with Josh Allen. There's no risk because you're doing this at some point it can come up where if we were to restructure a second and a third time, eventually you kick enough money down the road where that fourth or fifth year is a really bloated because you've kicked in the extra 20% over and over and over again. Um, does anyone on the panel not have the maximum base restructure to save roughly $21.5 million? Um, that's one of the easiest ones. And, and by doing that, we immediately jump from a $16.5 million hole to, hey, look, guys, we are $5 million in the good. We have a little bit of cap space. We can now have an offseason. Um, so that's our first one. Um, the next one is, I think, already decided when they did the deal. But there are some people who have a little anxiety with it because of the age, because of the injury. So I'll let you lead this one off, David. What are your thoughts on if we do anything with Von Miller? Um, I would say if something's going to be done with Von Miller, I mean, you're if you restructure, if you just do a sort of a basic restructure, you're looking at another 10, almost $11 million in, in, in cap room being, being made. But part of what made that Von Miller contract worthwhile, or at least – why it looks good to us is the fact that the first three years what you were looking at that was sort of what he was being paid to come here to do and, and get that money for that time and the other three were just kind of you know added on to sort of make it look nice and blah 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 it's not something where it, it was sort of easier to get out of at that point so if you keep kicking that down the road, that's fine. But, you know, how far do you realistically want to kick that down the road? This first year, you probably – you can make a pretty strong argument. In fact, I will make a pretty strong argument that that's probably what they should do or at least attempt to do um, because ultimately I think the the potential of, oh, well, we kept Von Miller longer than um, – we really needed to versus not having almost an extra $11 million. Uh, I'll take the extra $11 million. <laughs> so, Kevin, Anthony, do either of you feel strongly differently on Miller? I want to or, feel or you just feel uncomfortable with the fact I heard all the consternation <laughs> from Kevin and I was like, it's going to a thought. I'm just going to like go, yeah, do your thing. <laughs> um, I think they have to. I think it's the right move. I do have some thoughts about that as it did look good as a three-year deal. And now we're starting to alter it as we're kicking the money down the road. So there's discussion to not do it, but I do think for the better <clears throat> of the team, I mean, that's, that's how do you, you clear up a good chunk of change? Yeah. So I will say, and there's uh, comments in the chat. The, the thing people need to understand is this is not a decision right now. This contract was designed this way. The reason that they did it as a six-year deal is because you could do the maximum proration from years two through six. The reason that they did a larger roster bonus in year two than what his original signing bonus was is so they could do this. This was designed to be this way from the moment they signed the deal. Now, does that add a little bit of complexity when the player gets an ACL injury? Sure. Hmm. Does that add some concern, some risk that, hey, you know, are we going to feel great about this in 2025 in his fourth year as we're going into that? You know, that that is a legitimate question. But you are already so pot committed with this contract that it's already guaranteed for all three years. This check that we owe him in March for $13.3 million is already fully guaranteed. We have to pay him that money. Whether we pay him that money 
as a roster bonus or as a signing bonus is completely negligible in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. What it's actually doing in that 2025 season is yes. Now there's an additional $6 million there or the year after $4 million. That's not going to be the reason that we make that decision. If he's still playing and aging like Michael Strahan, like Bruce Smith, like some of the guys we hope, like we just saw Brandon Graham do for the Eagles, Mm -hmm. we're not going to care. It's going to be great. We're going to be paying him to keep harassing quarterbacks. If he completely falls off a cliff, we're going to move on. And the reason isn't going to be that we borrowed $6 million of those dollars this year to be able to function as a team and to put talent around everybody. So one, it's completely valid to have concern and anxiety. Two, you have to realize this was already agreed to the day they signed that deal last March when they did this. It was designed to be this way. And that, yes... Is it going to make us feel uneasy as it happens? Sure, but this was already put in place. This is already there. They will do what's called a roster bonus conversion. They're going to convert that roster bonus. You hear it sometimes as an option bonus uh, as how it's phrased in the second year. That's probably how this will be. It's not technically a signing bonus because it's not on the day you sign. It'll be a prorated option bonus. They'll pay that $13.3 million. We will pay for 2.5 ish of that this year and they'll spread the rest out uh, over the rest of the contract, it will immediately free up $10.8 million, and boom, we've now created $15.8 million. You can see the nice little scroll across the bottom of the screen. Um, we have now created $15.8 million with just those two moves for guys that are guaranteed to be on this roster the next three years, this year or for two more years, uh, and Josh Allen well beyond. Guys that were already guaranteed to pay this money. We've created no 2023 dead cap. We've done nothing to alter the roster. And we've gone from can't function as a franchise, not allowed to make draft picks, to now, hey, look, we can actually sign a draft class. We can function as a franchise within season. We probably haven't created enough money to go do any spending per se just yet. But we've at least gotten from can't do anything and can't function, swung all the way back to normal status and good to go so now it gets a little bit more interesting with some of the other options i'm going to count those two as locked in automatic guarantee Mm -hmm. those two moves i think are absolutely going to happen i would wager a healthy amount of money that those two things are going to happen coming into this year literally everything else we talk about from here forward is somewhere on a spectrum of could happen might happen, probably won't happen, and that's going to be the fun of the rest of this show is figuring out which ones we think are going to happen here. So, Kevin, I will go to you next on a man that we've already played around with a little bit. Do you think we go back to the well on Deion Dawkins? That's a tough one. It's always challenging me back and forth. There's a couple of options of what you could do. You could leave him alone, but there's a couple of options that you could just do your standard restructure with the way that his contract sits today or with only two years remaining, 2023 and 2024, you can extend the years out. Don't eat so much in next year where it could start to become a problem. Uh, if you do keep kicking the can to his final year, I guess you could mess with it next year. And in, in all reality, I'm not sure I'm here at his age to, to boost out his years right now. Um, so I did a restructure on Dawkins. I am going to the well. I think they need similar to how I feel about Vaughn. Dion should play longer, I guess. And I'm feeling pretty good about his longevity on the Bills as they're starting off tackle, as someone that they trust, as someone that they can continue to grow and be a stalwart in their offensive line going forward. So I don't think there's a ton of risk. I think it starts to get iffy next year. Um, but I think that that's when <clears throat> next year's the year. I think the years get added. But I wouldn't be totally shocked if they go to him and add years. I, I it wouldn't it's... be shocking at all. Hard to predict that, so I didn't predict it um yet uh, i didn't know like you know would it be two extra years three extra years i don't know what they would feel like doing but you can create 6.3 million dollars 6.393 million dollars right now greg and i'm feeling pretty good about being able to do so with uh with a restructure there also knocking his base salary down to josh allen's 1.08 million dollars um and i think that's the right move i i feel likely this could happen he's already done it i think they feel comfortable with him and i'm feeling pretty good about this one is not being a lock um there could be the years added, but I'm going to go ahead and submit that uh, as a way to save roughly 6.4 mil. Anthony, David, any any counters to that? Uh, I, I I agree in the the idea of it, although I did consider the extension as well with Dawkins. 
Yeah, I considered the extension piece. Um, but you know, so he's sitting there at 28 years old. I I think Deion Dawkins is a very he's he's a left tackle for you from like an on field perspective. Like you don't have to worry about him, and his contract has aged better as we've seen other extensions go through. I don't want to extend him right now just from the inconsistencies we see from him at times, though he is a, like a fine left tackle. I don't want to make it sound like he's bad or he's worrisome, but at his age and given some of the pieces we've seen with his health the last couple of years, granted majority of them have been COVID related and just some of the dips that we've seen in his play that led me to kind of just wanting to stick to the standard restructure piece. Um, and then, yeah, I fell in line with Kev restructure in that contract over the current lifespan of the deal. Um, creating that roughly six mil um, same page maybe anything different uh i i don't i don't love the idea of of doing this with dawkins just because you know it's basically what we've already said that being said i'm not like so against it that i want to really fight it so this is what it is for me yeah and i'm gonna there's this player and there's three more. There's four players in a bucket, and we'll get to them. It's, there's no surprises mm-hmm. for you guys. We're gonna go through the same discussion. It's it's Dan Dawkins, it's Trey White, it's Matt Milano, and maybe Stefan Diggs in that same bucket. They all have between like five and a half and six and a half million in restructure <laughs> potential. I can't tell you which of those four they're gonna do, but I feel pretty strongly it's probably gonna be like two out of the four that <laughs> they're gonna grab that chunk of money. Um I think all three of the guys are, are spot on in that I predict this to be one of the restructures. I also think if we look at Mitch Morris timeline going into his age 30 season, which was his last season under contract, that's one they ta- that's when they tagged on two more years at age 31 mm-hmm. and 32. That would make a lot of sense for Dawkins. We let it play out again. Mm-hmm. He didn't have his strongest season. He wasn't healthy the whole time. If he puts together a nice season this year, during the year where nine games into it, he's playing good. Be like, hey, love having you around, Dion. Here's two more years at 28 million, and we kind of keep rolling right down the road and add those two years on and probably some void years on top of it to make it, you know, stretched out. Um, but I agree that I want to see a little bit more, and it makes sense to do that in season. So we'll just do the base salary restructure now. And these next handful that we go through, you guys can nitpick if it should have been this guy versus that guy or which ones we'll talk about what the number could be if we flipped every single lever. But I do think in this group and I'll go to Anthony on the next one with Trey white. I do think some of these guys are going to get restructured, but not all of them. And honestly, which ones you pick isn't hugely material in the grand scheme of things. Cause we're adding risk for some of them, not for others. And that risk wouldn't change if it was a different player other than just getting lucky on a catastrophic injury. Very fair. And I think too, with the money we can potentially create from Dawkins through the next couple we're going through, like there is, there's like a difference of like one to two mil for everybody based on how you knock it down. So again, it's like, it's negligible to a degree from a monetary perspective. Um, So Trey White, similar boat for me in terms of the restructure. Um, So you're sitting there looking at his age right now. He's 28 years old. Uh, the contract carries him through the 2025 season. As of right now, he'd be a UFA um, in 2026. I think Trey is going to be on this team for the lifespan of the remainder of this contract. Um, I know everybody can still be maybe potentially trepidatious about how he looked this past year. I think as the season went on, he looked healthier and functioned healthier in terms of pivoting and planning and seeing more burst to his game. Although, he wasn't the most bursty player to begin with before the injury, but you started to see that health come back. And what I also think helps him with age as he goes forward, because he's not a guy that completely relies on athleticism as he ages, he should be able to lean into technique even further and it will help him age a little more gracefully. It's like a pitcher who's actually a pitcher when they're 25 and not just like this flamethrower who you're like, well, when he's 30 and he can't throw 98 anymore, like what's he going to be able to do? Um, Trey's fastball is his technique. So I think that helps him in the uh, lifespan of this contract. Um, but so his, his salary for this year, he's got a base salary, um, of $8.6 million. I restructured that for 2023, um, and knocked it down to the 1.080 minimum, um, that we've continued to talk about for the people at the service years. Um, 
that creates 7.52 million. Turn that 7.52 million into a prorated bonus over this year and the next two. So that's 2.51 each of the next three years. Um, so not to bore anyone or bog anyone down <laughs> with money after that. That saves about $5.01 million. Um, and that is the option that I went with for Mr. Shadavius White. I like it. Um, so I'm going to ask this differently to David and to Kevin. One, I, if I if I lump in Matt Milano and Stefan Diggs, and those four players, you have Deion Dawkins, Trey White, Matt Milano, Stefan Diggs. All four of them have multiple years left on their deal. All four of them have a base salary restructure range of five to six and a half million. Do I'm going to ask it more so? Do you think we do one, two, three, four of those right now? We've already decided on Dion. I think it's representative of that group. It doesn't have to be him per se. I think it's going to be two out of those four. Do either of you guys think that we do a third or a fourth guy or that we hold tighter and only do one? I'll start with you, David. I imagine it would probably be a. I think you're talking about a lot of money getting pushed down, or at least a decent amount of money getting pushed down the road. If you're doing four, I, I think all four is kind of unrealistic. I don't know. It'd be fun. I, don't get me wrong. Yeah, New Orleans. We, if <laughs> if we did all four, just with the two we already did, um, mm -hmm. we would actually get it to where I think it would be. Uh, let me look. If we did all four. We did all four. We'd be almost up to forty million in cap space That's just right. in these moves. So it is fun, um, I, but I do think at some point they they kind of ask some some tougher questions on some of those mm -hmm. things. Yeah, um, Kevin, how about you? Do you think they do? Do you think they do more? Do you predict they dip into a third one? I think I'm with David where four is unrealistic for sure. I just don't think they're going to kick that much, but I, I think three is conceivable. I, th I I don't know. I don't I don't believe it's fully off the table. I am probably leaning to. But I do believe three is enticing to them in the right circumstance. I, I was just going to say, I do it today. Yeah, yes, that, that's the key. I think that that third one could be like we saw this season where they had to go back to someone when they wanted to do the Heinz deal and they wanted to make a deadline trade mm -hmm. that they then did it in season to say, hey, we need to sneak a little bit of that money and be able to pull a little bit of that in. I think having two more guys with the kind of contract you can do that to in season is valuable to have in your back pocket. So that that's another reason that I don't think we see him leverage every single one of them right off the bat, uh, but that we go through there. So um, we'll try not to be too crazy with this. We could, again, we could flip through. If uh, you go through every single function, um, you you can create, I think I created 79.7 .7 million in cap space. If I literally restructured every single contract, you know, released anyone who wasn't bolted down, traded a player that's coming up here in a moment. If I did every single angle, I could get it almost to $80 million. That's one that, you know, we're not going to go through every single machination to, to do that. So we'll, we'll uh, cap that one there and we'll count the Deion Dawkins, Trey White, Stefan Diggs, Matt Milano group as two of them restructured, two we keep in the back pocket for in season and we'll wait there. That puts us at 28 million dollars in cap space right now now we're getting into a range where these are four reasonable moves we haven't lost any talent off the roster yet and mm -hmm. we are now in a position i was going to say somebody uh billy's in here giving me a heart attack that i needed to go like uh i saw uh, that and i was Twitter. like is that what he's saying or that really happened? yeah correct so i'm really glad that billy clarified this because he first wrote in the comments that Derrick Henry was traded to Buffalo. And I was like, all right, we're going to have to stop the show and go do breaking news to, to be able to cover this. So I do appreciate Billy clarifying in the comments that that was, yes, Jeff Darlington did propose that the move he would like to see is Derrick Henry Me getting too. traded to the Bills. But um, he gave me a heart attack here live on air. That I was like, um, I need to stop and go search Twitter to see if this is real. All right. Um, so now we're getting into a range where now we're getting into some tougher stuff where either the decisions can be, there's a couple more restructures we could play with that you guys can propose them if that's what's on your list. Um, but now we're getting into, do we start to remove talent from the team in order to create cap space or to obtain an asset and different ones? Um, so Kevin, you can lead off with this next one. What do you do with that Oliver? Oh, man. 
I thought about this <laughs> long. Just and, a, oh, oh, I thought man. about this long and hard because I like the player. I think maybe even more than the average fan. We saw um, we've seen flashes of dominance. Yeah. We've seen flashes of, of dominant play, mm. and then he disappears for three games. Yeah, and you know he's had some injuries, some nagging stuff that I know is weighing on the team too. I think that the 10 five you can save is very appealing to me. I think it's very interesting. I think you can double dip in this area where you're saving money and you're getting rookie assets. So I think that, or a player, I guess, I think that, that there is a double. So for me, I thought about this long and hard and gone back and forth. I've thought about an extension. I don't know how that would end up looking. I've thought about leaving him and letting him play on. Uh, but I'm proposing that a trade of Ed Oliver, because I think he has value. I think, you know, everyone's bouncing around. He's going to get a six. He's going to get the bills. Wouldn't, I don't think we'll move on from him at a six round pick. I just, I'd rather have him play out. Um, so to me, I think that he had, he is worth that asset. There are plenty of teams out there defensive minded that could develop him and think that they could really get the most out of him in return. The bills can shave $10.5 million off the cap and receive assets in return as well. So I think that with the two issues, I think that it combines to be pretty lucrative to where we're taking phone calls to, to at least entertain this and to see if we can get into range of it. But my proposal, I'm not trying to stay by the book with everything today. That was the one thing I had on my mind with, I'd like to propose at least making a difference on this roster. That's going to mostly stay the same. So that's, there's some good defensive tackles I've been looking at in the draft, but however, that's my proposal need it approved, but I, I like the ability to save the money and get the picks. It's nice to me. Anthony, your thoughts. Ooh. So this is, this is a tough one. I, I echo some of Kevin's initial sentiments here where, and, and Greg yours as well, like the inconsistency, the, the games where you're like, did Ed Oliver, Ed Oliver play today? Like you have to replay the game in your mind and really try to figure it out. I don't think he's been as bad as, Everyone seems to have been piling on um, with him this offseason. But at the end of the day, he hasn't played up to the ninth overall pick in a draft. And I don't want to extend as of right now. I, I, I do think that's an option. But with what what he's shown and what potentially he's looking for, I don't think an extension is on the table right now. something that I want to commit to. My worry with the trade piece is... I don't know what his value is on the open market, given the level that he's coming off of this year. So he's coming off in like a, a season where he was knocked up. Kevin, you know, you mentioned it with how the injuries and how he was banged up a little bit. The raw stats aren't there. I don't know how much a team covets him. And then I worry about creating another hole by trading him. And there are several defensive tackles I like in the draft as well, but I don't know. Like if, if you could right now, if you could guarantee me that the Bills can trade Ed Oliver and end up with Kalijah Cansey from Pitt, I would be okay with that. But I worry about going into the draft, having to fit a specific need that you probably have to fill earlier than not. Like if you're looking at Ika or Clancy or Maisie Smith or any of those dudes in that range, you're probably going to have to spend a second or a third. If you're trading Ed Oliver, if you say you just get a pick back for him, probably getting like a day three pick back somewhere in that range. Like at best, we're thinking like a fourth or a fifth, like maybe some team goes nuts and they decide to like get a third, but I don't know how realistic that is. So that means you're committing an earlier asset in the draft to fill the hole that you created. I'm not against it. That's my only concern. My initial piece is just letting him rock out on this last year and taking that cap hit. And then we see what happens. I wouldn't be opposed to a trade at all. I just worry about the logistics in terms of what you get back, the hole you're creating, and then having to fill that hole and hoping the right players fall to you. Um, or again, some of the guys too, right? Like we also require some kind of scheme ability, like, Cansey is a like for like fit, which is really why I like that idea. But you know, for, for Ika and Maisie Smith, I saw was in the chat a whole bunch. Like those are technically bigger body dudes who are more in the Daquan Jones mold than they are the Ed Oliver mold. And if you're adding another guy like that, are you changing fronts? Is it less four three over penetrating one gap style? Are you playing more gap and a half? Are you playing more two gap? Are you like what is the identity? I think that raises some further questions. And just because it muddies the water so much, it's harder to nail down. 
I'm not opposed to the trade. I'm going to say sit on him for this year and let him rock. Um, but I would be on board with the trade in theory. So obviously the entire decision comes down to the return uh, that you're able to get for Ed Oliver. And I will tell you, I, I poked around a little bit on this, talked to some guys um, in some other markets, some other areas. I think that like is often said, we're more critical of our own players than what others are. There are other GMs out there who had Ed Oliver as a top three player in that draft who will mm -hmm. convince themselves that they're the team to unlock his play consistently. We've seen the dominant play of what's there. I, yeah. Jerry Jones has seen it a couple times uh, in, in what we, you know, what, what he did against Dallas and the way that he's approached some of those games. Um, I, I'm not saying this is what I would project, but someone that I trust, someone that is a, a known uh, entity in, in our space thought that he would go for a second and a fifth wow, um, okay. in, in that space. Now I'm not saying that that's what it would be or what we would get, but that that's, I'm not making that up. Like I've heard that, that too. I trust that they think that's closer to what his market would be. So in this exercise, I want to go through the motions of what it would be because there's a domino effect of mm -hmm. doing this that one, yes, it does create a hole. But in the difference of some of the other moves where there's a significant dead cap hit and you're creating a hole and there's additional cost you're taking on in order to also replace that player, you're almost scot-free with that Oliver. Mm -hmm. So the way I would propose it to you, Anthony, is instead of now leapfrogging defensive tackle to one of the top slots in our draft needs, $10.7 million gives you some flexibility where now I can structure a replacement contract mm -hmm. of a Greg Gaines, a Kalen Saunders, a um, Sheldon Rankins, and be able to get those at a first year cap hit of four, five, six million, even if it's a little bit higher, it's a seven or eight million dollar deal, where I'm then replacing him in function, letting those players play next to uh, a Daquan Jones, saving another five or six million dollars on it getting back assets that we can use to invest in positions and that's the kind of move that is on a much smaller scale i'm not saying that this is a tyreek hill type move but the way that they approach that was hey we can trade an asset that is valuable mm. get something back also repurpose that cap space in another area this is a much lesser deal much lower area but if wanting to go through there I, I won't lie. I think there's a handful of defensive tackles who could look pretty decent next to Daquan Jones. I, I think that there's others who could thrive in, in that capacity. So um, I think there's possibility to it. I don't think it's going to be a Duran Payne. I don't think it's going to be Javon Hargrave. Of, oh God, I would love to put Javon Hargrave next to uh, Daquan Jones. Um, but I do think that there are some next tier guys like the names I rattled off, the, the Sheldon Rankins, the Kalen Saunders, the Greg Gaines, where – players like that could be had at a reasonable number doesn't stop you from investing in a draft pick. Um, and some of the other players, you know, we have free agents at defensive tackle that we have decisions to make on, on Jordan Phillips as well. Um, so for this exercise, I actually think it's worth going through the process of what it would be like if we were to trade him, um, which would put us at $38.7 million in cash. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Anthony. If we guarantee for the panel, if we guarantee you're getting a, at least a, even if it's a, any day two and correct, actually a, a third and a six, that's a we're all signing up for that. Yes, I, I would. Uh, like, I would need a day two pick. I yes. would need something. Even if it's a two. third round pick, right? Yes. We're signing up for that. Okay, a third yeah, round I, pick. I'm in. Sure. Okay. Yeah, and I think that. So if it's a, if it <laughs> if it's below there, if it's just a fourth, oh, I say no a fourth and a fifth. Yeah. I would no. I would hold as well because I would rather have the known quantity. Yeah. Of just keeping that Oliver's I don't inconsistent care. But high flash play. I wouldn't care who they sign. If they get a second and a fifth, fine. I don't care who comes in free agency. <laughs> well, because then that extra second, you could keep the money and just use that pick on the best defensive tackle available in that spot, yeah. replace him directly, and save $9 million ish yes. out nice. of that yes. equation. And so you're still, again, you're still looking at like potentially scheme fit uh, questions and the right guy falling and so on and so forth. But I, I I'll I'll take that and then take that free money and run with it. Um, yeah, I would I would love that scenario if they got a second and a fifth. Much like we always do the joke of like I am running to the podium to like announce that pick. <laughs> I am running to the fax machine to put that through to the league office. Like no disrespect to Ed, but that return yeah, given correct. what 
he's been like that output could be either cobbled together in in free agency or um again with some of the defensive tackles if you go earlier uh with that so yeah if they were getting a second and a fifth i would be a smiling man so we'll leave it at there that the the cover one panel if we can get a day two pick we would be open to it but we need a day two pick in order to do it um so we will assume that we can that brandon bean is able to extract a a day two pick um from uh from some uh you know hopeful uh suitor he did for Uh, ronald darby I mean, yeah, 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 you're not wrong. He did. He got a third round pick. All it takes is we say it all the time. All it takes is one. It literally just takes one team to be like, that's my guy. And it's like, okay, like, and and like we said earlier, there were a lot of people who liked that Oliver in that draft. So there's also a new coach with a defensive mindset in Houston that is looking to add talent with a pile of cap space that that's something that could make sense. Yeah. Um, Jermaine Edmonds. So, <laughs> oh, Jesus, Anthony. Uh, all right, uh, we've saved yeah. enough already for him. Okay, <laughs> yeah, wait, don't give it up. We, we are now where, yeah, there, there are plenty of heck. I'm going to bring up the point when we get to it. Um, lots of people in the chat are talking about the tag and trade idea, and that I've actually been one of the people that has said that's not actually not real, that's not a possibility. I've actually kind of backed off of it a little bit in that as I've done these exercises getting ready for this show. The fact that we can create 30, 38.7 million in cap space pretty quickly, if you had a deal lined up relatively quickly and you only had to have Tremaine Edmonds count as 20.9 million for a pretty brief period of time, mm. you actually could. You actually could put, you couldn't let it dangle out there forever. You would have to like already have the deal lined up and, and spoken to. Otherwise, we couldn't function in the offseason because that would take up such a huge chunk of space. Um, but it's a it's a possibility of how they could approach it. Um, reptile rubbing it in that we got a seventh for uh, Wyatt Teller. First oh, off, it was a fifth and a sixth. You take that back. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know they can't all be winners, folks. But we also don't know that Wyatt Teller was going to turn into Wyatt Teller if he stayed with the Bills. He went to the Browns and got to be developed by yeah. one of the best offensive line coaches in the history of football. Like yeah. it's it's not a like for like guarantee that if he stays, no. he turns into that guy. It's the We've same already- with like. We've already had discourse over this like two years ago. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's, no, let's, more, let's no, more, no more, no more, no more. <laughs> he got return um, on his investment too. That's all you can say. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so one more name that's come up a fair amount that um, I I think I know what we should do with, but I, I want to discuss it. Don't want to assume. David, what would you do with center Mitch Morse? That is an excellent question, a, a fine question, a question that deserves to be answered. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's it's a very complicated the the answer is nothing. Mitch Morse obviously has been a, a very good center for the Bills. Um what they ask him to do for this team um is is something that I think is going to be lost on a lot of people and it, that that includes me sometimes. Um but what they what they generally ask for for this guy to do is is a lot and not every center in the NFL can do that. Um, and I hear, okay, so let's, let's just, let's go, let's go process elimination. I'm not in favor of cutting Mitch Morse. I don't think that's a, I don't think that's an option. I don't want to do that. <laughs> that's, Good not, answer. That's, all, that's all we're here to do. So let's eliminate that from the table. I don't think trading Mitch Morse is going to really do anything. Cause what's the, that? It's not. It's not going to be anything close to. We'd what we eat just six million in dead cap, and it would create there's, there's create five million that. in space. Right. So now you're looking at restructure or leave it be, maybe extension. So let's talk about extension, right? So he's 31 years old, and he's had. I think this year was his so sixth, far in his career. His sixth documented concussion. seventh one. Yeah. <laughs> it was either a sixth oh, or a seventh documented one this year. Yeah. yeah. So that's tough. Um that that that's that's pretty tough to to say like we are going to absolutely commit more money down the road to somebody who's 30 years old and has seven documented concussions. I I don't see that happening. Um a restructure, I mean, that is ultimately going to give you $3 million, a little more than $3 million. 
is that worth pushing that down the road? It's not a lot of money that's getting pushed down the road. It's also not a lot of money being saved either. And if you're, if we are, you know, we're, 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 we're in a right? But for the sake of context of what we're doing right now, we already have as our, our lovely ticker that our, our, our incredible producers have put together uh, are showing us right now. We have 38 dollars in cap space with the moves of restructuring guys like Josh Allen and Von Miller and trading at Oliver, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I wasn't sure if it was just me, uh, Ralph. Here's oh, no. Th- this has been an issue for a hey, while. David's so, Wi-Fi is also confused. Florida Internet. <laughs> Um, so Kevin, <laughs> Anthony, do you guys feel differently? I, I concur completely. I debate, I, I wish the idea of cutting him is absurd. He was yes. probably our best yeah. offensive lineman this year, creating a Definitely. hole when we the already best. got three other holes uh, on the offense or three other spots that need to be improved is n- no, not necessary. Um, I also don't think he, we've already, we just extended him to age 31 and 32. I'm not ready to put more money in that basket i I do want to make sure that he's okay and and ready to continue playing and for that reason i also don't want to restructure him so my my vote on on mitch morris is we let it play out as is do either of you feel different agreed love the two years remaining i think it's a great deal i think they did a good job with it for starting center don't it's not broke technically yet um let it let it go like he's tremendous you're all worried about the concussion but yes bang He's super underappreciated. The only, the only, I'd love to extend him for like five more years, but I, the I concussion agree. history is what Correct. it is. Correct. 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 Yeah. Correct. If he didn't have the concussion so, history, I would propose extension. So, so we have now entered, the, those were the queued up names on our list. We have now entered the, the wide, wet, wide, uh, the wild west, wide open space of, of our show here. I'll lead things off. My first proposal extend Daquan Jones. Pretty please keep that large, massive man here longer than, than what he already is. Um, Daquan Jones basically was signed to a two-year, $14 million deal. I just give him another one of those. You could have two more years at $14 more million. Um, if we were to do that, we not only get to keep his large, massive body in the center of our defense for multiple more years, we get to do that along with saving another $2.8 million. It's just free money. We get more Daquan Jones for less cap hit. It's a wonderful thing. Um, does anyone feel against that magnificent, beautiful plan? Beautiful. I like that you I told know. us ahead of time you were doing that because I had it in my notes and I knew you were going to do it also. So I just wrote Daquan Jones extend. Details will be provided by Greg. Yeah, I just said <laughs> yes. So that was my note. I just said yes. So yes, um, that's where I'm at with him. And which we traded at Oliver. There's... I think it's the perfect solution. Yes, you need you need that still in our life. All right, uh, Anthony, what is your next mystery surprise proposal? I so again, my my main one from a realistic standpoint and a team need standpoint is the Daquan Jones one. All others are more kind of nebulous. I forget what Steve Carell movie that's from, but that is nebulous. Um, the Office, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. He's yeah, like, is Nebula. He says that on a call. I think with David Wallace. Yeah. Good call. Nice. Well done, Kevin. Well done. I flirted with the idea of extending Taron Johnson. Mm. Okay. Because of his importance, because of how good he is in his role, um, especially with if Poyer doesn't return, potentially seeing what happens with Micah Hyde the year after, like the consistency from a performance standpoint on the field, from a leadership and culture perspective off the field, a knowledge perspective, him and Tredavious white become like tremendously important. If that safety position all of a sudden is in flux and then potentially the other corner spot, like I know Elam and Benford look good and you still got Dane Jackson in the mix, but I don't know, maybe Elam and Benford don't work out in a couple years from now. There's all the more question marks there. We know what we have in Taron Johnson proven commodity. Um, proven quantity there you can say I so I ended up not going with it but that was my main one I flirted with the idea of extending Taron Johnson as of right now he is a UFA in 2025 um he has a base salary this year of 5.5 and 6.4 next year um again you can save a decent chunk of change um by extending him and then knocking down that base and playing with the numbers um signing bonus is relatively low already for each of those years so that's fun as well um, I ended up not going with it, but that was the one that I heavily flirted with back and forth. I like it. Um, I, I will say 
I'll almost guarantee Taron Johnson is going to be extended, and I'll almost guarantee it's next year. I, I think that he is a very super similar to Deion Dawkins' discussion. I can absolutely see two or for him maybe three more years can he tag down maybe another three-year deal just like he got this three-year deal yeah push um, it to like an age 30 season 31 yes, potentially for him. correct yeah. we have him through age 28 you sign him through his age 29 and 30 seasons had two more years on um and i th- i think that would happen next year going into the final year of his deal so i like that one but i think that one's a little bit early uh kevin what is your uh next mystery proposal don't hate me um but i've thought about it and it's one that I just got to get through. Got to do something to Naeem Hines. Um, and I'm probably going to get overruled, but I'm going to propose that we cut him. Um, I like the full savings. I think you can utilize the four six. We're nickel diamond taking a mill here, mill there, like we were just talking about with Mitch Morris. I think the four four, uh, the full four six could be meaningful this year and next year. He's two year deal still, as well as. Util- I know it's two roster spots we would need to fill. However, mm-hmm. I think that they can be strategic in where they would sign a free agent or draft a player knowing that they could fill the same two roles in the draft and still save some money and then have more money to kick somewhere else. A Mikko Hardman, it, what, what, it, who could obviously produce at the receiver position with half, ha- you're halfway there already. So I think that there's options there, in my opinion. I propose cut them. If he is willing, and we don't know, to take just a flat two milli right off the top and stay, I think I could get down with that with some likely, you know, not likely to be earned incentives, even, you know, whatever the situation may be. I think they can move on for him, kind of rehab that running back room and still find a kick ret- someone who will dual purpose as a kick returner and not need to have a, a special kick returner roster spot as they're approaching the offseason. That's my proposal. I probably am going to hear some, some, let's see if he takes a pay cut uh, rebuttals. But my my immediate proposal, I thought about this. We've talked about this, uh, is to cut him four six is a lot of money. Puts him currently as the twelve highest paid running back in the league. It's too much for me. I want feed James Cook and I want a rookie running back. So I don't see the running back path for him. Um, so that's my. I think James Cook can take on the receiving running back role. So that's my personal <laughs> suggestion to the panel as my mystery move is to cut him, not just lop off a couple million. We don't know that he'd take it either. Anthony, David, uh, Anthony, we'll start with you. Any thoughts on Naheem Hines? I would like him to take a pay cut from the perspective of the returnability and potential gadgetry. Um, I do think it's very interesting that he didn't get used more in the offense as the season went on. Mm-hmm. Like there's, and maybe it's just because they liked what, because again, Singletary and Cook were both successful down the stretch. So it's not like they were bereft of talent at the running back position or effectiveness. Like, and when they did run the ball, they were successful. So I don't know if it was, you know, really just a special teams driven move and they really just wanted him for a returner. I, I, I just can't shake that. It's really weird that like, he didn't even get like manufactured touches as we went down the stretch and, uh, to Kev's point, there's a ton of really fun rookie running backs in this class. There's also a ton of really fun running backs in free agency. And the combination of all the available free agent running backs and all the available running backs in the draft <laughs> means that everyone's market kind of gets driven down a little bit because it's like, well, I don't have to pay so-and-so or I don't have to spend this draft capital on this guy. I can wait until someone comes knocking at my door because there's all these like available guys and we don't have to go out of our way to spend big money or allocate big draft resources unless it's B. John Robinson, who is a unicorn and a beautiful human being. That's a conversation <laughs> for another time. Um, I'm fine. Tune with, in to disguise coverage for further I, yeah, r- running back. Where, where I take on the masses. Um, I, I'm fine with cutting him. I just, it, it's not even because he's bad or not effective, but like, Again, having a cap hit this year of basically $4.8 million for a dude who might get worked into the running back rotation, but who's probably just your main kick returner, like that doesn't jive considering the other needs they uh, need to fill. I'm glad that people are coming around to the Miko Hardman train. He's someone I've had earmarked for a while. I like what he does from an offensive perspective schematically, but also, again, yeah, throw him for the return duties. Also, just like – I'm a, I like, I value special teams a lot and I value the return game. Devin Hester is one of my favorite players of all time. Mm. Kick returns aren't really a thing anymore because everybody booms it out of the end zone. So even if like Hines is the best returner in the NFL by a huge margin, 
the odds of him returning kicks like isn't tremendously high nowadays because you kick the ball off from like the opponent's end zone with what they want to do to reduce hits. So I am fine with cutting Naheem Hines. I'd love it if he took a pay cut, keep him around. Um, but I'm fine, you know, honoring Kevin's proposal and then moving on with that, uh, that money from this year and addressing running back and special teams. David, do you feel differently than wanting to release him? No, not really. Um, I, I like Naheem Hines. I think that uh, there is a, a very clear role for him on an NFL team, even on this team. Um, but if you're just not going to use him, then don't pay him. So I think this is one of those self-fulfilling decisions that they've already decided on those other pieces and that's why they decide to do X. So one, I do think we need to keep in mind, we did just give up a player and a fifth round pick Mm -hmm. for him. Um, I, I have a feeling this, they knew what contract they were absorbing. This is not a surprise to them. Mm-hmm. They knew what it was when they got it. I won't be shocked if they already had some of this discussion w- when that transaction happened. Um, so I agree. I think there's incredibly low chances that he is on this roster at, I'll use this, the uh, over the cap number at 4.79 million. I don't think there's any possibility that that's what he's mm-hmm. here as. Um I'm torn on – I think you guys are very logical in that we didn't see the usage that we expected. I do think there's some pieces to it that you're probably talking about needing – You know, unless they bring in a running back ahead of James Cook, James Cook can't be the primary back and mm-hmm. the receiving back. I don't mm-hmm. think we're going to build an offense that all of a sudden has that. So you need a player as the secondary running back in some nature, whether it's a J.D. McKissick or whether it's just another running back. Mm -hmm. And you need a primary returner. In most offenses, that's not the same human. It's possible that it could be, but it's not super common that that's the same guy. So there is some efficiency in him being those spots. I I don't think having James Cook and Naheem Hines prevent you from drafting any running back that that we have uh, in the draft that that could come up. Matter of fact, I want them to draft a running back, even having – uh, Naheem Hines and James Cook. But it only makes sense to restructure him if there's a plan for him. It has to be more. You're not, I'm not restructuring somebody, even down to I can easily build. You know, he had pretty good usage the previous years. You can build some not likely to be earned incentives where he could earn all five million because there is a scenario where he's a five million dollar player if he hits all those incentives where you could get him down to two million, 2.5 million, and then let him earn it back. But that only makes sense if you're going to incorporate him into the team. So mm-hmm. um, I am going to respect the panel. I am going to um, Kill release Naheem Hines. Naheem, <laughs> you uh, trial by combat. Um, we, we will release uh, Naheem Hines. We will save the $4.8 million. Um, my personal vote is I think it's more likely that we're going to see a restructure and him stay on a not likely to be earned incentive. But it's hard to argue with the fact that they didn't use him when they could have. So what we're going to find out is, and I don't know if this is realistic or possible, but first they're going to go to Devin Singletary and say, Hey, we can't afford to pay you, you know, some of these deals that are out there, Chase Edmonds deals and things like that. But if you want to stay for pretty cheap, we'll give you this money Uh, and they'll just cut Naheem Hines and give Devin Singletary the money. Um, and go that route. If Singletary's agent says, hey, now we want to go test the market, they're then going to call Hines agent and be like, hey, we really like you to stay, but we can only afford this much. And then he's going to say, either he's going to look at the free agent market and be like, yeah, we probably should take what we get, or say, no, we're, we, we think we deserve that money. Then they're going to say, all right, fine, we'll just cut you. And then they'll wait and see if one of them doesn't has a softer market than they think and let them come back for cheap. Or, like you said, go sign one of the fun free agents or just wait for the draft and draft one of the fun free agents and go from there. I do think, I mean, they're not all of a sudden going to stop carrying three running backs. They've carried three running backs the entire time that they've been a front office here. So it's going to be James Cook and two more humans. And I don't know who those guys are, but you know, we'll see where it goes for right now. We will release Naheem Hines, add 4.8 million to the docket. David, 
Do you have any further deals that you would like to propose? I'm going to, I'm going to throw one out here. Um, and that is Tim settle from the roster. Um, I liked the idea of Tim settle. I always felt like he was redundant when they signed Jordan Phillips back. Um, I don't necessarily, because they're both weirdly certain that they're basically shaped and built like big one technique types, but they play more of that like disruptive sort of almost like what you would expect a three technique to be Mm -hmm. probably as pass rushers than they are as run defenders. They're very odd types of players based on how they're built. Um, And I think that if you're asking me just based on what we of Jordan Phillips and Tim Settle, I felt I felt like Jordan Phillips was playing well before he had his shoulder fall off, yeah. um, and Tim Settle just sort of like well, made like a couple of plays, but there I, I would be very hard pressed to recall a, a moment of like, oh yeah, that's why they went and got Tim Settle, you know, yeah. like. It, and the, it, it the just, challenge with Settle is last year it was fine when it was at 2.6 million because a rotational fourth defensive tackle at 2.6 million is uh, fine. Like, you know, it's not awesome value. Of course, I'd rather it's a UDFA or a seventh round pick or something. But 2.6 million is totally tolerable. That's just totally reasonable. This year, the cap number is 4.9 million. Uh-huh. I, I need more than, you know, a guy who can soak up some snaps as Z tackle four for 4.9 million. Cause you know, Anthony can, can you swear on a Bible that Tim settles better than Eli and or Brandon Bryant? No. And uh, if we're going to look at some numbers, there were 238 defensive linemen with 20% of pass rush snaps this past season, regular season and postseason combined. So 238 defensive linemen. Tim Settle was tied for 208th in pass rush productivity with oh. a score of 2.7. Josh Uche was first at 12.8. I if played we wanna... around with some of the efficiency metrics today. They're all bad. They're all bad. <laughs> They're all then, bad. Now, some of you might say, yeah, but maybe his numbers are really good when Von Miller was there because when Von left, the whole defensive line took a hit. So that's fine. We can go into that. So weeks one through 11, 240 qualifying defensive linemen. In pass rush productivity, Tim Settle was 210th out of those 240 weeks one through 11 with Von Miller. Weeks 12 through 18, Von got hurt in week 12. There were 213 qualifying defensive linemen. Tim Settle was 192nd out of those 213. When you watched him on tape, when you watched him in the games, he disappeared at times. I don't think he's as bad as those numbers indicate, but he, similar to Ed Oliver, had games where you were like, is Tim Settle on the roster still? Because like I just don't like realize what's going on. He had some snaps where he popped, but they were fewer and farther in between as the season went on. And yeah, I think that monetary value, Greg, that you mentioned, that 4.9, like you might as well just call it five. It's egregious at the level that because he's basically your he's playing at the level of like a fourth defensive yeah. tackle and you're paying like your fourth defensive tackle five million dollars or like you have a cap hit of five million dollars, I should say. Like that's rough. Yeah, and the the tough part is it, there's a little bit of flexibility. He does have a $3 million base salary and a $250,000 roster bonus. That roster bonus is due March 19th. So we're going to know before March 19th. They're not going to pay him that money without deciding this ahead of time. That's also a number that they can approach him and be like, hey, we don't want to just kick you back out to the, to the market. We want to keep you here but we need to convert some of that to now you can take advantage of last year's bad stats. We want to convert that to not likely to be earned incentives where if you play well, you can earn that back. And it's not that hard for a defensive tackle to earn $5 million. If you're disruptive in the pat in the uh, pass rush and you're getting sacks and pressures and, and creating, you know, wreaking havoc, you can do that. So I, he's similar to my thoughts on Naheem Hines in that. I don't think he stays on this roster at 4.9 million. I'm not sure that means we're going to release him. I, I, I think there are paths where I don't really see a path where it's an extension because it wasn't great last year. So I don't think that's the hmm. right logic of all of a sudden we're going to 
um, you know, extend him. But I do think there's a pay cut path that's feasible because he didn't have a great season last year and his agent's not going to be eager to go out there and try to get um, a new contract when it's coming off probably his worst season so far. So um, I, I'm going to put Tim Settle as a, a pay cut candidate, and I'm going to say that we shave $2 million of that back and not likely to be earned incentives, but we keep him as the fourth defensive tackle and then if, um, you know, Eli Ankow, Brandon Bryant, or fifth round pick X beat him out, well, sorry, tough luck. We let you move on and try to try to do what you can do. Um, so we'll we'll see where where uh, those uh, pieces go to to figure out where it's at. Um, I'm so figure out where I'm at the rotation. Anthony, back to you. Any other surprise deals that we haven't gotten to yet? I have one. Uh, no, I'm good. Okay. No one's mentioned Isaiah McKenzie yet. That was my. That was yeah. That was okay. My. I just All assumed. Right. Well, I thought is he was. I, is, is that a isn't surprise? Isn't he coming? I was. Isn't he? I thought he was on the docket for like guys that were kind of out on. I just. I thought. Okay. I don't, I guess okay. I'm making it. Up. Um, I thought he was on the outline for later. So that's why I, I don't. <laughs> okay. So we'll go through. Um, I, you know, he the, the Bills actually, and this is probably more of a. Um, compliment to Brandon Bean than anything in years past we've had a handful of contracts that it was just a matter of time we knew they were going to be released it was just too obvious that the cap savings beyond the dead cap was so much more valuable than their roster spot that like last year AJ Klein whatever it was 5.9 million or whatever it was which is very obvious that okay there's no possibility that guy's going to be on the roster I'll say there's actually not that many of them on this roster. Like Naheem Hines is the biggest question, but it's, it's just the number. It's actually not the value. Like I think most people see him as a reasonably value, valuable roster spot. It's just not at that number. Yeah. Um, one of the few release candidates that's on there is, is not Isaiah McKenzie. Um, if they were to release him, they could create roughly 2.2 million in cap savings and only eat a $300,000 dead cap hit. Um, I, with how many, you know, slot capable receivers are in this draft that are really strong possibilities in, in the first three picks in the draft. I think that's just such a likely possibility. There's also an awful lot of competition in the free agent market of guys that could come available. Mm -hmm. Um, guys who have a history with our new wide receiver coach, um, different paths. I, I would propose that we release Isaiah McKenzie. Is anyone against that move? Does anyone think it would be the pay cut discussion we had with Hines or Settle? No, I'm okay. Good. All right. So our next move was releasing Isaiah McKenzie for two point two million guys. I guess he and Hines could have the trial by combat. Are we up? There for we that? go. There we That's go. Fun. I think they're the, I think they're the same height. Well, the NFL um, would probably be up for that. They'd make a special out of it, put it yeah, on ESPN. Oh, yeah. Pay per view. Like, yeah, yeah, with cash. Pay per view. We'll put it on like Amazon. What was the the, their show that they had on the with the with the Cardinals, we'll, we'll have the, the full oh, yeah, behind the, the scenes, the yeah, training nice. for it. Um, so guys, we've created fifty million dollars in cap space. That's a lot of fun. Good for um, us. yeah, good, good, good job, guys. Good yeah, job. Just <laughs> pats on the back. Uh, Kevin, any other moves that you had on your list? Um, the McKenzie one's interesting because I I just think you can couple him and Hines, and then we're getting into like a Meek Hole Cardman range of of being able to fill in a couple of roles as we're talking about being versatile. I really did flirt with the Taron Johnson extension as Ant mm -hmm. did. Uh, I think that he's a, a guy that's pivotal to this defense. He's your base starter. He's basically your third linebacker. There's a lot of, a lot of things to like for him, but yeah, as of right now, we're getting a little nutty, but I think that this is, this is good. Like, I think the only other discussion I have to bring up, we talked about at Oliver, we talked about others. Do you cash out or extend Gabriel Davis right now? I think that that's a pivotal discussion in this in this argument. So I will say there's a handful of other names that are very. They, I guarantee there are discussions going on right now about contract extensions with both Gabe Davis and Tyler Bass. I think those yeah. two are being discussed absolutely right now. Neither of them are for cap saving purposes so I'll, mm -hmm. i'm gonna we'll save that i think it's good content for each of us to talk about on our shows and to be able to go through there absolutely is a path where that can make sense 
they would only it would actually be really difficult to extend them and not increase their cap hit, giving them any signing bonus, giving them any other pieces. Both of them, I think, are more likely than not to be extended with the team. I think obviously, I think more people are in the boat of yes, absolutely extend Tyler Bass. There are probably some people who are more against uh, extending Gabe Davis than they were say coming off last year's four touchdown game in the playoffs. No, really? Um, I, I've heard some people uh, frustrated. People with, are with frustrated Gabe. with Gabe it's, Davis? It's shocking. What? Um, so we'll let that discussion yeah. breathe on some of our other shows. They are absolutely in play. Um, and I will even say, you know, technically, every time and everybody wants to know my process when I go through this, the first thing you should look at for extension candidates is who is a free agent next year. So the reason I didn't bring up Taron Johnson is, the Bills don't have a history of jumping two years ahead. Hmm. For the most part, they do like they did with Dawson Knox. They do like they did with Matt Milano. They extend in the season coming up that's your final season. Many times it's before, like not Matt Milano, they push to like the, you know, the 11th hour to extend him. Um, So that's possible with some of these guys. But a lot of them, they do like Taron Johnson during the season, like Dawson Knox going into the season of that, that final year. And they then extended out further i think that's absolutely some of the stuff we'll see there technically micah hyde is in that boat i don't Hmm. you know coming off spinal fusion surgery i I don't know that i see that extension coming but in theory he is that's one of the reasons that all of us had daquan jones in our notes um all of those are there i don't think there's other a lot of other obvious ones there's two other names technically on the list from a cut candidate standpoint. I'm not proposing either of them, but I've heard names come up of AJ Epinesa. You'd only save 1.4 million. That's not yeah. nothing, but that's you know you basically that's what you would have to spend. Yeah, at your best case scenario of replacing him, I'm okay with him as a replacement level defensive end. I'd love mm-hmm. more, but he is what he is. Mm-hmm. Um, Saran Neal's the other one. You know, it's more than I want to pay for a gunner. It is. But I also think this Taiwan Jones has played his last game in a Bills uniform. Mm-hmm. I don't know that we need to lose all of our special teams aces. Like Tyler Medikevich is a free agent. Um, I want there to be fewer spots on the roster that are special teams only players. But I don't need it to be none. I'm okay with Saran Neal being a, a strong point there um, and being one of the gunners that we know is the guy there. Um, so before we move on to any other, maybe spending a little bit of money, um, any other moves, releases, extensions, anything else we haven't touched on before we settle on our beautiful, fabulous $50.5 million in cap space. Trade Stefan Diggs. <laughs> <laughs> so for anyone who hasn't seen me lose my freaking mind. Um, it makes a I lot know, of financial sense. Didn't we cut Josh Mike Allen? Florio, I know Mike Florio put it out there. And if the most frustrating part is, of course, Pro Football Talk put it out there with the clickbaitiest, you know, headline possible. And when you click it, which of course I did because I wanted to get angry, <laughs> and read it, he he explains that you know there's no financial reason he hasn't requested a trade. It's very unlikely. It's way more likely that they just you know decide to make two of their best players happy and move forward, and that he just was frustrated with the loss. Well, no shit. <laughs> We're well aware. Um, and that trading Stefan Diggs would create a $37 million dead cap hit. If Stefan Diggs came out tomorrow and literally said, I demand a trade, I'm never playing another down for the Buffalo Bills, they still couldn't trade him. It would destroy the entire season. They still couldn't trade him. Like it, he's not getting traded. It's not possible. They're not going to do it. But to um, Kevin's point, we already cut Josh Allen, so it makes sense to cut. <laughs> so you know, back. now you might as well send him with over. to go where it goes. Okay, so we now have um, our tough part done, and we're not going to go into a ton of detail on this because. I do think that it's really good content for each of our other shows to figure out how we want to spend, what our free agent wish lists are, um, how we're going to be able to go through and and do that. But we'll touch on a couple of things here. Um, so whether it's uh, a guy that's an in-house candidate or someone specific you have in mind, maybe we'll throw out one or two each. I'll start with you, Anthony. 
Um, is there maybe one in-house and one outside? Is there a player that you would like to use a little bit of this cap space on that you have your eye? Um, are we allowed to talk about Tremaine Evans? Yeah, let, let's go ahead. Let's kick it right off with him. So Tremaine Evans, I think, is the the low-hanging fruit for that option. I know there's different monetary values kicked around, um, but if we're looking at the linebackers right now, especially after Roquan reset the market, so Roquan's at the highest in terms of average annual value at $20 million. Then you got uh, Darius, well, now Shaquille Leonard at 19.7, Fred Warner at 19.045, then CJ Mosley at $17 million, Aluakon with the Jags at $15 million, Wild, Deion Jones at 14.25, so on and so forth. Based on that tier and what Edmonds has done, I think he falls somewhere. I feel like the ballpark of $17 million per is kind of safe, give or take a million or two here. Um, and then his age obviously factors in he's 12 years old, so he's super young. You can cash in on multiple contracts. That's where I start to worry. Like, does he, or not worry a lot of the bigger linebacker contracts, like Roquan and Leonard and all those guys like Shaq Thompson, Jerome Baker, a lot of these guys are in that four, but usually five year range for that contract, just ballparking with everything kind of playing devil's advocate from a worst case scenario perspective. Well, not worst, worst, um, I'm going to say a five-year, $90 million contract for Tremaine Edmonds, average annual value of $18 million. Um, So it doesn't put him at the highest AAV. I would give him $47 million guaranteed at signing, which would be the highest for a linebacker. Roquan was the previous highest at $45 million. Um, That $47 million guaranteed will come from his uh, from a $25 million signing bonus plus his 2023 salary, his 2024 salary, and 2024 option bonus that I gave him. Um, also giving him a sign to mention – Signing bonus of twenty five million. That would also be the highest for a linebacker. Roquan was the previous high of uh, twenty two point five. So he gets to kind of reset the market in some of the little areas without you know grossly going over anybody in particular. Um, and then the way I broke down the contract, um, I layered it so his base salary in twenty twenty three is three million dollars. Twenty twenty four is six. Then it goes up to 10, 15, and 15 um, from 2025, 2026, and 2027. Got the signing bonus and roster and option finagled into there. Um, but that's what I did with Tremaine Edmonds. I like it. And it's what's your year one cap hit? Uh, a base salary of three. And then with the signing bonus, so eight mil. And you could knock it down if you wanted to go okay. like lower, like you could. I okay. just layered it yeah. out to not pay, like it. pay the Piper too far down the stretch. So it's good. Yeah, the way I, I actually played with it all the way out to a sixth year um, okay. and did like the exact same setup idea that we've seen with Von Miller and Josh Allen, where you have the initial signing bonus is a little bit lower. <laughs> and then the second year where you can oh, have take it, take it um, another guaranteed option bonus that prorates out. And again, this I'm actually not joking about his age because of his age. You actually can do a six year deal and expect to see six years out of it. Yeah. Um, and he so wouldn't I, even be too opposed to sign that because he can yeah. sign a six-year deal and still have another yeah. good contract. So have a, another third contract after that, which is crazy. Um, so I, I'm torn. I've talked about this on a lot of different shows. You know, Brandon Bean has to decide either. You know, if Brandon Bean values him, where so you know I've seen you know, PFF has him. You know, pretty low. Spot track has him at 11, which is absurd. I. I I literally yeah. yelled at Mike in DMs about <laughs> what is wrong with you. Like the, you know, that number is wrong. Um, and the same idea, you know, I, I talked to Brad a little bit about his number. I get it. He's using more of the Aluicon. He's putting him a full tier below those other guys. And I, I do think that he's not on the level of Warner and Leonard, mm-hmm. but the market dictates that not, you know, if he's the best linebacker available, which he is, He's the best linebacker available. And if we let him go to f- true free agency, I actually think he's going to get Roquan steel. I think there'll yeah. be enough bidding and enough teams going after it. I think he'd get $20 million on the open market. I don't think that's crazy. Um, Even if so, you go real quick off of like the numbers, like I, I think Roquan is fantastic. I don't think he's better than a healthy Leonard or a healthy Warner. And he makes more money than either. of correct. them. So we can't always go by the scale of like, well, this guy Who's gets paid better. the market. Yeah. Exactly market dictates it exactly your point exactly and so either brandon bean has said in our calculus he agrees with brad or he agrees with mike over his spot track that you're a 14 million dollar guy in our eyes that means he's leaving or hey we think we need to keep you at whatever the market setting number is and i'll tell you guys i can build 
a six-year, $120 million deal at $20 million a season and have the first year cap hit at $7 million and the second year cap hit at $9 million. Like you can do it if you want to. It's not, you know, that there are plenty of ways you can do this. So I agree with Anthony's proposal. I have it at 17.5. I have it at six years, 105 million. I can make a first year cap at a seven million and a second year cap at a nine million. And then his first big season is the last year of Matt Milano's deal when he's 30. And that's how you do contract layering. That's how you structure mm-hmm. it so that it lines up where it is. So I am completely 50-50. And whether that happens or not, I, I don't know. Um, if somebody's agent has already told Tremaine Edmonds, which I think we've heard the rumors floated around that his uncle's going around telling people that he already has six years, $120 million lined up. Uh. Um, I, I don't know. If he does and he wants that and the Bills have decided we love you, but we're not going to do that, I, mean, I don't know where it goes. Um Kevin, do you, do you feel strongly different from where ours is? I'm not even asking if we're going to do it because no one knows. No one can right. know if we're going to or not. Would you do it if it was going to take 17.5? That's where I that's where I get lost I would, a little bit. Um, I would ease 17.5. Easy. I would do this for 20 million. I would give him the Roquan deal. Wow. I'm okay with that. Right. Well, good for you. I know, I know I'm in the minority with that, <laughs> but I'm okay with that. Good for you. Um, to play it a little bit, is there other options available that the team in this scenario has designated? I don't know. I don't know that answer either. Is that designated day like Jermaine Pratt at nine? So I I will tell you, Eric and I have done a fair amount of work going through the free agent linebackers. We've dug through a fair amount of the guys that are out there. I think Jermaine Pratt's an $11 million guy. Um, I've seen people that have him closer to nine. That's interesting if you start going down that path. Um, again, I can, because of Tremaine's age, because of our comfort level, he doesn't miss games, the dependability, you can use that to deflate the early cap hit. Anywhere else, say we go down to the other end of the path and we go <laughs> a Band-Aid kind of deal with an Anthony Walker, with a Deion Jones, with a, mm. um, with a Leighton Van Der Esch. Yeah, those guys are cheaper, but it's a short-term deal. I can't hide the money. So they're also going to cost us $7 million in cap mm-hmm. in a cap hit in 2023. Well, if both guys are a $7 million cap hit, I'll worry about the other crap later, and I'll keep the guy who got all pro votes and, and that we've developed for five <clears throat> seasons. So that's the part that's hard for me is I don't feel super comfortable paying $30 million at linebacker that in today's NFL. I, I don't want $30 million at that position. I can come up with other spots. I'd like to spend that money elsewhere. But also, what's the point of taking a super traitsy, high ceiling player in the first round, watch him get better every single season over five years, and then let him walk after his best season? What's the point of drafting those guys if that's how you're going to do it? I, I just, I can talk myself into it in both directions super easily. And I love pretending to be GM. I'm super glad it's not my decision. (laughs) I'm super glad that Brandon Bean has to figure that out because I don't know. But when it comes to your deal, I'm I'm good with the deals both of you have to kind of talked about. I think that those are and and that's what it would need to be is that hey, we're only soaking Mm -hmm. up in mine it's seven and Anthony's it's eight, but like that range. If we're only soaking up that much of the cap space, that's where I'm on board because then we can do other stuff. Counterpoint, what if you get into double digits in his first year of his cap hit? For whatever reason, that's the way the deal had to go. What, yeah, where he's, do you go? He's asking for more up front. And so yeah, yeah. in the scenario we designed tonight, I've told a lot of people online, and I, I, I meant it when I said it, but I'm, I'm going to backtrack a little bit, <laughs> um, that there's no possibility we can franchise tag him. I, I, still, I still don't think that there's a super likely path that we do, but the fact that before we got even a little crazy with the trades and some of the other releases and stuff like that, we got up to like 30, 35 million pretty fast Mm -hmm. in cap space. Mm -hmm. If you've already put some feelers out there and you know that Joe Shane and Brian Dable would really like to pay him a whole lot of money and are willing to give you a little something for him to do it or whoever, and you already have those things lined up, and you only need to have him franchise tagged for a little bit, you know, 
maybe it takes some of the steam out of the first wave of free agency that maybe we weren't going to be super involved in anyways. And then we trade them and it frees it up and we're able to be a little bit more of a bargain shopper with a little more extra money when that time comes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I've now gone from there's no possibility to now, I don't think it's going to happen, but it's maybe more technically possible than what I thought it was initially when I did. I, at one point, I just literally thought we could not fit it. It's not possible. Mm. Now, I do think there's technically a possibility if the intention is to trade him. I don't think there's a possibility we mm. can go into the season with, with him at 20.9 million as a, as a cap hit. Um, I don't think that's feasible. But if the intention is to uh, to trade him, maybe maybe we could dabble in that a little bit. Question and, for the panel. Would you rather have Tremaine Edmonds at, we'll call it 17 and a half million, or Jermaine Pratt at 11 million? It's what are the cap right? hits? That, because oh. that, that uh, does matter. Well, and that you can play with either of them. Yeah, so correct. say you could get Pratt down to five million. And you yeah, get say down that to off like two or three. Yeah. You know, a little bit lower, but not that much lower. Mm. You, you can't go, it's hard to, and like, because you're probably not signing Jermaine Pratt to a six year deal. No, you know? no, for sure. Um, it's hard, right? The real cash and savings, like, you know, we talk cash to cap all the time. And we talk yes. about what that means, um, but talk about, you know, we just wrote a lot of extension checks. Um, we talked, we just wrote a lot about front of Pagula's money. Um, yeah, we did spend a lot of Pagula bucks. Real today. money, like real cash yeah. here going out the door. This isn't cap cat. This is real money. This is anti uh, Ralph Wilson. Um, <laughs> I think that ultimately you could consider cash at some point and be like, Jermaine Pratt wouldn't cost us as much money. Jermaine um, Pratt's good. Yeah, and he's like from the Bengals fans. Point, yeah. Tell me he's better than Tremaine Edmonds. Th there are absolutely right. people listening to this right now screaming into their headphones that, yeah, do it. It's an upgrade. He's better. There's absolutely. And I'll even tell you, he's a better run defender. Jermaine Pratt's a better run defender than Tremaine sure. Edmonds. And I think Edmonds is a better pass defender. And in today's NFL, I take the pass defender. But I don't know no. if I want to pay 17.5 to 11 million. Like it's, right? it's super it tough. I take it's Jermaine Pratt tough. to answer the question. <laughs> okay. I, I don't think it's crazy. I don't think that's crazy. No, I, I don't I think, think I, I, I don't, I don't think, think it's crazy, it. but I'm still taking Tremaine Edmonds. <laughs> that's fair. Pratt, in that that's like the that for me is like <clears throat> a really I got into I mean, I was following the Bengals for a majority of the year, but really prepping for the first Bills Bengals game and seeing like Pratt's coverage numbers, like for linebackers are for advanced metrics, like he's towards like he's like one or two or three yeah. or five in like almost mm. every metric. And then you put on the tape and sometimes he would even come off on third downs, which was weird. But dude is flying around. He's athletic. He's rangy. Mm -hmm. Like he's violent. He adds bite. Like I think that's a realistic. It's a game that like I literally play in my head like every yeah. day, like just making up numbers. Like would you take, you know, Tremaine Edmonds at this or Jermaine Pratt at this? And because I don't think Pratt's a bad linebacker. And then if you can take that money you've saved and all of a sudden reallocate it and buttress some positions that you have needs at, it becomes a very interesting discussion, interesting conversation. Just because Pratt came up, I was like, ooh, like, what do we do here? So let, let's let's pivot here because I, I don't want to go into like hour three. Um, with our safety position, we've talked about it in our, our you know, staff chat. There is so many variables at the safety position. I already mentioned Micah Hyde's fused spinal, you know, vertebrae or whatever the heck they did. We obviously know Demar Hamlin's heart and his brain. You know, like how what what do you have in you to line up and make that next big hit? And are you ready for that? Um, we have the entire, uh, you know. Benford project, whatever that is. is. Is it to stay at corner? Mm. Is it to transition to safety? Is it a post Micah Hyde developmental move? Is it for him to come in and try to compete day one? Then we have the market for Jordan Poyer. Um, I think Jordan Poyer is a two-year, $25 million player. I think he's a $12.5 million guy. I don't think he gets the Quandre Diggs deal. I don't think he gets the Harrison Smith deal. But I think mm. he's just under those. Other guys who are very sharp, very intelligent, know this projection game very, very well, have him as a eight, eight and a half million dollar player. Um, if he goes out into the market and isn't getting the level of deal that he's expecting, 
what is the price point? And I'll start with you, Kevin. What's the number where you do bring Jordan Poyer back? What does it need to get to knowing that it's not a long-term deal, so there's not going to be a ton of flexibility in first-year cap hit versus long-term and that you know you can maybe take an extra one or two million off, whatever your number is uh, of what they the average salary is. But in general, we're going to have to pay pretty close to what we pay him. What do you need that number to get to in the open market before we bring it back? I like the two-year deal with a void year in there. Um, but I also like eight and a half. I think that's intriguing to me. I think at that number, it's not much more than he made now um, against the cap. And then we can lop off a little bit. Um, six million on the cap, set six and a half, seven. I'm feeling like, why do we need to entertain these, these safety options? Use a draft pick, high draft pick, or pivot to someone we don't know can fit in this defense. We know how good Hyde and Poyer can be. Eight and a half is very interesting to me. And I think that's my max which is funny because it's probably his floor. Um, Agreed. But, that it would that'd be where well, it would marry up. Yeah, for my max and his and the floor, that's my number. I think eight and a half. I think the Bills have to take the call and be like, we like you. We know what you can do. That's a reasonable deal. We just made 50 million. Maybe we took Pratt in this situation too. Maybe a okay. Pratt and a Poyer combo. That's intriguing to me. And I, I think that that number, I think there'd be some a, a little bit of, re- just a little bit of, contention among bills fans but i think at eight and a half people would and then they see the cap hit i'm gonna do it anthony would you go higher than that my max for him is like 10 and a half per 11 per tops i i'm very torn on this i I think he's important to the fabric of this team both on and off the field i i and i'm not talking like from a fan base perspective i think he's one of the engines and drivers of this team I also think he deserves to test the market and get whatever he can get. Like I have absolutely no problem with him going and chasing like 12 mil a year. Or if someone gives him even higher, like, Oh, like go do you man. Like he gutted through playing with one arm this year and a multitude of other injuries. Like he's been awesome in every way, shape and form. I also the injury piece last year and just some of the inconsistencies we've seen from him come playoff time when the teams, he's a tremendous safety. And the year that he had in 2021 from an advanced metric standpoint was unreal. Like he was number one in anything that really mattered for like a safety and top three at like worst. He had a phenomenal year. When we tend to have certain matchups in the playoffs against these higher powered spread offenses, I think some of his skill set allows him to he not not a vulnerability, but allows some kind of weaknesses to develop. And then that combined with his age and where this defense is going is the reason that I max out. I would love to have him back. If the number was eight point five, sign me up right now. Like I would gladly take it. Um, my max for him though, yeah, I could maybe push it to eleven. Um, and if we want to get creative with some void years and some numbers, I'm okay with that. But like a two year, $21 million, two year, $22 million. Um, that's really my highest. Maybe you try and sweeten it by giving him like a higher signing bonus. Um, and then pairing that, um, to really try and kind of like sweeten it for him and give him more money up front and guarantees. Um, but yeah, I'm 10.5, 11 is like top, top for me. Yeah. I, I feel pretty strongly that the only avenue that we get Poyer back is that his market is softer than they expect that they don't get that deal and honestly I think if it's a double digit per year deal it's from someone else I think that once it crosses over so like my number is 9.5 like once it crosses over into single digits and it comes out of double digits is where now all of a sudden we're we're on the phone now all of a sudden we're talking we're now all of a sudden we're like oh well if you're gonna take that we'll talk about that Mm. Uh, and go that route. David, where, where do you see Jordan Poirier? So maybe it's because I've already resigned myself to the fact that I feel like Poirier's just not coming back. Mm. But it's, so with that in mind, let's, let's just assume that's what happens. But this is uh, this is not like the best free agent class, but there's a lot of like mid-tier safeties that are kind of worth giving like a solid amount of money to not like, you know, Eric like, and I not... had a, a lusty conversation <sighs> about Ryan Neal earlier today. That's like, right. That's, that's right. Sneaky. Like he has a lot of 
when Poyer came out of Cleveland, there's a lot of mm-hmm. things like that. They're like, Hey, he just finally got some playing time. There's potential yeah. there. We get him for the cheap and really cash in. He, I'm trying to find the next player. I want to find the guy we can sneak and right. feel really good about. There's after. guys. There's guys like maybe. And again, I I'm not somebody who's going to pretend like they're fit for the German defense because I don't know exactly what that's going to be. But there are guys like a Nasir Adderley or a uh, uh, who is this Taylor Rapp from the Rams. Um, who are like potentially just solid options that you feel comfortable with. And then there are other options just in the draft that will be available later. Not necessarily like you got to take this guy in the first round, but there are guys that can be taken later. So you have that veteran option that you can, that you have that you feel comfortable enough with. And a, a guy that you're developing in the background who can come in maybe this season or whatever. And, as I've said, pretty much since Sean McDermott and uh, Leslie Frazier have gotten here, if there's one thing they could do, it's just turn defensive backs into mm-hmm. solid contributing types of players, mm-hmm. um, unless you're Jaquan Johnson. But <laughs> um, regardless of that, I mean, if, if, if they let Poyer walk, I imagine they just bring some sort of veteran in, just given the amount of uncertainty with guys like Hyde and Hamlin – you have to bring some other option in so that you can just say, all right, we have this. And, you know, again, one of those other options might be Christian Benford converting to safety because you now have depth at corner. Um, I just think that I, I, I I just can't bring myself to be like, yeah, Poyer's definitely going to come back. You know, we'll just throw enough money at him when we create $50 million. Well, and, you know, obviously, Brandon Bean might not be on our level. It might not be able to, to create what we can. That's true. That um, is true. So we'll go around the horn here. Um, one last name from each of us. Uh, it can be an internal player. We haven't talked about, you know, a, a couple other pending free agents that we have here. It could be a name that that's really, you know, at top of mind uh, out there in the market. We'll start with you, Kevin, then go to David, then go to, to Anthony, and I'll close it out. Uh, Kevin, what is your one name that you want to spend some cap money on to either keep or to bring in? Got to upgrade the guard position. Uh, Ben Powers is a guy that one of the best pass blockers in the league. We've just created 50 million. It's great, but we need, we, there's a reason we did that. Uh, and I think it's to do a plug and play guard, uh, a guy that I think (laughs) has a lot of good film, um, will really help us on a passing team. I think I'm willing to give him. I mean, I've seen many projections on him, so it's been hard to kind of hone, hone in on what exactly I, I've seen I the lowest on the board. The lowest, yeah. One. I mean, you know, I'm I'm not like I said with Poyer, I'm down for the lowest one too. But I think getting to about nine, nine and a half. I think that's uh, that's right per year. It sounds about right over a four year deal. Um, so I have four for thirty six, a six million dollar cap hit this year, um, eighteen guaranteed. That's I just think he could come be in a passing offense, uh, really utilize his skill set, still can hold his own in the run, um, and maybe upgrade the entire line. Maybe you move Bates over to left guard, keep Powers at right guard. There's different yeah. scenarios there. We Powers saw how much is, better Bates yeah. played when it was between yeah. uh, Morris and Seth, or uh, Morris and yep. uh, Dawkins. So you get an upgrade there. Now you got a pure upgrade at right guard. You still have Morris at center. Maybe that helps Brown. Um, yeah. But I think right then is a plug-and-play guard, and we don't need to be desperate come draft day anymore. Um, but that's where I'm spending my money. Bills need to protect Josh Allen, and I think there's a natural guard fit there. Um, And we created the money. Strong proposal, Mr. Fox. How we do? uh, What's your what's your wish list? Um. So I'm looking at this offensive line class. I don't know how much money some of these guys are going to get because this is not like a superstar class. There's no like standout, like this is going to be like the guy who gets a bunch of money. And what that means is there's going to be multiple guys that get more money than they probably should. Um, And maybe that's a Ben Powers. Maybe that's a um, Isaac Samalu from Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I like Samalu. I think he's a very solid, good guard. Um, I also don't really know if he is uh, Aaron Cromer's type at guard. Um, Some people who might be, though, or at least one would be uh, David Edwards from the Rams, who obviously has worked with Cromer and worked under Cromer. 
it's not something I'm super excited about. Um, and I would feel more comfortable with somebody like Sam has just like been solid throughout his career. Um, and is somebody that can just sort of come in and step in and be a really good contributor right away. Um, I just don't know if the Bills feel that same way about him. And I also don't know. I, he just seems like one of those guys that's going to get like a lot of money. Um, and I don't know if the Bills are also going to. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like it. I like it. Uh, Anthony, <clears throat> who is your your number one in your heart that you need? I did it initially based off of like when we were kind of like assigning positions in the chat when we initially talked. So I focused on safety. Okay. Um, I think Je Jesse Bates is awesome, but I think he's going to be priced out of the Bills range. I am extremely, 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 extremely intrigued. This is part one because I like the play style of the player. Also part with what I envision for the safety position and some tweaks needed for this Buffalo Bills defense. Uh CJ Gardner Johnson from the Philadelphia mm. Eagles and the, the attitude that like that granted he maybe gets multiple guys in a season to punch him in the face. So <laughs> maybe he's kind of a jerk, but the, that kind of tenaciousness and the bite that he adds to a team, it, it's like adding like the, 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 the sandpaper, the grit, like the hockey terminology that gets used for like playoff teams, like what he adds from a, a tenacity perspective I think is something this defense could use or this team could use in general, but it's also more about, you know, he's 25 years old, a safety that can play in single high looks, split field looks. He can play in the slot. He can play in the box. He can play man. He can play zone. He can play match coverage. He can blitz. He fits the run. He adds pop and juice to your lineup. My only real consternation with it is, you know, if he's a psycho, uh, but two, what, this was the first season where the majority of his snaps came at deep safety or where they mm -hmm. where they were a factor. Majority of his career, he's either been a slot or a box safety. But this year, it was more deep, mixed with some slot and box, which is also, again, like part of what intrigues me, the ability for him to function in a variety of ways and the looks that I love Poyer and Hyde, but you can take like – like CD Deuce and drop him into the slot and cover a slot receiver yes. and like function and like a big look nickel. what that lets you do with Taron Johnson. He can get Taron Johnson can now be involved in the disguise coverage. And that is in wink, wink, nudge, nudge, disguise coverage. That's also my piece. Like Eric and I talked about on the film from a couple weeks ago, like the idea of using more looks where like Taron Johnson is like the split field safety in a cover two look and pieces like this. And now all of a sudden you've got more guys where the defense has, where the offense, I should say, has to be like, Who's dropping on this play? Who's in the flats? Like, who's in the hook curls? Like, just all the mental gymnastics you have to do in accounting for these guys. Um, so I wonder what kind of deal he gets because he is this, like, hybrid trending more towards safety. I think it'll really depend on what a team is looking for. But right now I'm thinking he gets somewhere around, like, the Buda Baker deal, which was uh, four years, $59 million, like an average of 14 uh, 0.75 per. I think it falls somewhere in there. We just saw the Marcus Williams deal last year for five years. Um, and what he got paid, like, I think he falls into that Bayard Williams, you know, Marcus Williams got five years, 70 million, 14 per, uh, buyer got five years, 70.5 million, 14.1 per, I think he falls somewhere in that range, which isn't crazy. Like if we were talking for, for me personally, if I'm talking the max for Jordan Poyer was like 10.5 or 11, I have no problem giving CJ Gardner Johnson, like around 14 for what he offers. And he's 25. I give him like, I would give him a 40 year, $58 million deal. Also in that range, Love probably him. a little lower. I'd consider throwing some money at Von Bell from the Cincinnati Bengals. I think he's similar in that tenacious bite perspective, but also again, a versatile guy, a guy who splits his time in the box and deep gives you a lot of versatility. Someone down the pike who I'm just starting to get into from a film perspective comes from a defense that is more single high base than what the bills run. Um, Donovan Wilson from the Dallas Cowboys, a thumper. He played more box and uh, deep coverage this year. He's another dude. He flies around, hits dudes like a missile, regardless of if they're a running back tight end um, receiver. And he can play deep about to be 26 years old. I see his ballpark in terms of AAV as like 6 million. So I think he's someone down the pike. Um, he could potentially give some money out again. I'm diving into the tape now and liking what I see, but I want to see how he functions more deep. So he's more of my like realistic cost fit. Let's take a guy more in the, um, you know, the Seahawks safety mold 
Ryan um, Neal. that Eric was yeah. breaking. Exactly. Like talking yeah. about that and being like, oh, this guy might be something. Let's see what we can do with Ryan Neal. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think Wilson falls into that mold for me as well. I like it. Um, I know you had mentioned earlier so, some names that have been kicked around here that just want to give some some shine to. I know you've had uh, Miko Hardman on your list. I know I've seen um, one name that I, I haven't seen come up a lot that if we do miss out on Tremaine Edmonds and we go the shorter term veteran route, I, I think there's a pretty significant rebuild going on in Tampa Bay. Levante Say yes. David. <laughs> Levante David makes a lot of sense. Like, I, I mean, there's it's. He's older, but we've also seen Bobby Wagner and guys like that play really well late, you know, yeah. into their 30s. Bobby Wagner played damn well for the the Rams last year. I got I got in a fight with somebody about you know the Wagner should have got the all pro spot over uh, Matt Milano. Um mm. so I mean he he played well enough that somebody was fighting me uh, about that. So um I think that's interesting in some names flat. I love the recommendation for powers. I think that that offensive line is a spot where you know, some of that development curve of a rookie offensive lineman, I wouldn't hate plugging somebody in there at one of those spots. I don't, I, I think that there's a really high top end at tackle and then a pretty significant drop off. I don't have that middle range tackle that I would want to push Spencer Brown. So mm-hmm. I don't, I think that's more of a draft path. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, all the different names that are out there, if I'm going to splurge and we go with the direction that we had here tonight. I'm going to throw one out there. I, I'm going to go after Delvin Tomlinson. Um, and the, if we were to trade that Oliver and to have some money to float around and to figure things out, he's incredibly consistent. <laughs> yeah. He gives a little, you, you talked about it earlier, Anthony, that it's not as stereotypical of what our previous approach had been. Mm. And that it lets you do some different things. If you have, him on the field instead of Daquan, him next to Daquan, of what they can do, and that it gives them a little bit different look of where it is. And he would be a player that we would absolutely, Peter, really appreciate Whoa. you, man. That's, that's yes. awesome. Thank that's, you. That's, I feel like he meant to give like $10 and was like, no, 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 no. I hit next to zero. <laughs> Hold on. I hit the wrong button. I hit, I take that back. Thank um, you so much. <laughs> yeah, that, that's awesome, man. We, we really appreciate you. Um, you know, it, I think you could also throw Draymond Jones out there. I, I joked about Javon Hargrave earlier. Um, mm-hmm. If we were to do what we proposed tonight and trade um, at Oliver, you know, Kevin has brought it up and, and lots of guys here. You can play with the first year cap hit in an mm-hmm. awful lot of deals. I can give Draymond Jones $58 million and still make the first year cap hit look like $7 million, yeah. um, you know, and, and stretch it out. So, I do think that there's a possibility if they were to trade out trade at Oliver and let Jordan Phillips walk, all of a sudden that's like 16 million that they had invested in defensive tackle that you could now reinvest as another player there. And you know, still need a, a big season from Gregory Rousseau. You still need Von Miller to come back. But if you now put that together with uh that combination, you could certainly make a lot of things work. And even if we mi- missed out on Tremaine Edmonds. But you could have somebody like Levante David come in and put Daquan Jones and Delvin Tomlinson in front of them. You could uh, be able to go through there. So I, I love that. Uh, Fry Daddy did the math yeah, that was here. Really good. Uh, yeah. If all 268 of us watching right now pitched in a mere 167,000, we will pay for Josh's 45 million this year. Venmo him. He'll make sure he gets taken care of. We can trust Fry Daddy. Um, that's awesome. Uh, to be able to go through. He's a reputable yeah. source. And I was joined to joke around Ralph Wilson's uh, senior, which is awesome that Ralph Wilson still listen, watches our show. I really appreciate it. Um, so, uh, yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go around. I actually was going to joke about signing a punter, but I, I didn't want to trigger Kevin. So I'll, I'll uh, we'll, we'll <laughs> wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, you know, I, that's going to be a discussion at some point of, you know, what do you pay Sam Martin to come back? I'm not going to take more yeah, time right. on the show to go through and do that, but it's, you know, there are some names like that. We didn't talk about Devin Singletary tonight. There's other guys down the list. There's an awful lot of guys on our free agent list that we created enough cap space to invite them all back for minimum deals. Come fight for a roster spot. I welcome you all back. I think, you know, Tyler Medikevich is at that point for me. Um, Questenberry, but, you know, Bobby Hart, guys like that. There's guys I want on this roster, but not going to pay extra yeah. money. Let them come back. Yeah, Shaq Lawson, by all means, welcome back. Come on back. Fight for a roster spot. I'm not giving you extra money but you're welcome back on this team. Um, So awesome job by everybody tonight. This was a ton of fun. 
Um, we're going to build some graphics out of this. We're going to send out to you guys, show you some of the moves that we did on the official ones that we did. Our official number before we uh, got into the fun of how we would spend it was $50.5 million that we created. That was a created space. So we actually created moves that totaled $67 million. We made up for the $16.5 million hole that we're in and then created 50.5 in usable space. And I, I know somebody in the chat asked earlier, my estimate, you know, it, one, the draft picks always take less money than everybody thinks because they're most of them are replacing other minimum level, mm. minimum level guys. Even if we estimate on the high end at, at 5 million, it's usually closer to two or 3 million of what we actually need. But let's say, let's just for, for sake of argument, we'll, we'll earmark 5 million there. And then Brandon Bean likes to have 10 million in the season to work with for replacement guys, injuries that happen. That you need to bring somebody else in a trade deadline move. Um, so even if we were on the conservative side there, we've at least created 35 million in usable cap space to go out there and truly spend on upgrading this roster. And I'd say besides the Ed Oliver trade, everything else that we did is I'd say <coughs> very likely to mm probable i don't think we had anything outrageous we only did two out of the four maybe restructures we only released two players out of the entire group um we left mitch morris alone we only did one extension we didn't do a lot of crazy stuff and we got it up to 50.5 million so um really great job i'll go around the horn here let the folks know what you have coming up on your next show where they can find you and then we will sign off kevin why don't you start out let them know what you have going on over going deep Yep, just finished yesterday's episode. Actually, a lot was a lot of it was on the whole Poyer, really in depth on the Poyer discussion. Excited to get some clips out for that. Um, Tuesday, seven o'clock. We're also working on our continued free agent specials and draft as we get closer uh, in March. And we're gonna trust me. I'm really into free agents. I got some paths for the Bills, so that's what we'll be working on. And and I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but the Eagles said they're gonna s- franchise um, Gardner Johnson. Mm. Well, cancel the season. This sucks. Yeah. I'm out. This episode. But I like I like your Von Bell. Uh, I, I really yeah. think that's a reasonable uh, yeah. path. Thank um, you. But yeah, uh, seven o'clock Tuesdays. Appreciate everybody tuning in as always. Beautiful, David. Let the good folks know. So you can find me typically on the uh, Cover One Roundup podcast on Monday nights at seven p.m. with my usual uh, co-host in chaos, uh, Kyle Salagi. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at DFAUXY or at DFOX. You can also find me this Saturday on uh, one of our newest podcasts, uh, the Cover One Extra. Uh, so uh, look, look out for that as well. So uh, I don't know who's next, but someone else. Awesome. Over. Anthony. Uh, things immediately coming up the pike. Myself, Chris Kepner, and Mr. Adam Stencil will be live with our Sabres uh, playback watch party tomorrow night. I know, you know, times are tough after getting thrashed by the Leafs, but more important games on the docket will be live tomorrow night right at puck drop for Sabres Tampa Bay Lightning. And then as far as Bill's content, I am the host of Disguise Coverage live every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Mm-hmm. Eastern. Yep, a little switch there. So live Tuesday every Tuesday, 9 p.m. Eastern for Disguise Coverage. I'm also one of the co-hosts of the Cover One Film Room, live every Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Next week, um, Disguise Coverage will be focused on some NFL Combine stuff, um, and then the Film Room will be focused on some free agent targets on the defensive side of the ball from a film perspective. Um, Of course, I'll always have film on Disguise Coverage as well. And I like long moonlit walks on the beach and strawberry daiquiris, and that's me. (laughs) You can also find me at Greg Thompson uh, here on Wednesday nights with Aaron Quinn on the Cover One Buffalo Show, as well as my new show on Friday nights, the Greg Thompson Sports Show, having a lot of fun. For anyone uh, this week, if you've enjoyed Mike Camerlango's 60 Second Classics and some of his awesome reviews of famous movies throughout the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, uh, I had him on to debate our top five sports movies along with Drew Gear from the Rock Power Report, which, as you can guess from those two names, we had a heck of a fun time being able to go through there. So I would have that interview along with some of our other fun segments on Friday night having fun. So make sure you check that out. It's a new show we have along with all the rest of the awesome guys here and the rest of our lineup on Cover One. Uh, we appreciate you guys very, very much. This is one of our favorite shows every year. We all put in a ton of time and research and preparation getting ready for this show. Hope you appreciate it all the time and effort. I know uh, we had Chris Kepner and AJ Sabolski in the background being able to help us out getting everything rolling uh, from a production standpoint. 
Uh, our man Andrew will be out there, uh, statistics, uh, putting together some graphics from the takeaways from this show. Uh, we appreciate all your time. This is always a, a lot of fun every year. Uh, you guys were awesome in the chat tonight. But on behalf of Kevin Massar, on behalf of uh, David Fox, Anthony Prohaska, I am Greg Thompson. You have been listening to the Cover One Salary Cap Extravaganza, and we are out.